So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel round his waist. Then he poured some water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter. Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? You do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later. Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, you will no longer be my disciple. Lord, do not wash only my feet, then. Wash my hands. And head, too. <laughs> Those who have taken a bath are completely clean. And do not need to wash themselves. Except for their feet. All of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put his outer garment back on and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I've just done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And it is right that you should do so because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you. So that you will do just what I have done for you. I am telling you the truth. No slaves are greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Then Jesus gave us a new commandment, and that new commandment is that we are to love one another. That's pretty tough, isn't it? Then he, then he adds another dimension. <laughs> Just in case you decide what level of love you want to show one another. He says, and he gave you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, as I have demonstrated love for you. To follow the example that I have shown you. 
A new commandment, he says. A new commandment. A new commandment. See, a new commandment. A new commandment. A new commandment. That means it's a, it's a commandment that didn't exist before. You see, under the law, even, even under the law, you were allowed to hate people. You were allowed to hate your enemies. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And he says, a new commandment I give to you. Everybody said, I said, love your enemies. I mean, they must have thought, the guy's lost the plot. <laughs> Do good to those who hate you. Come on. No, we're going to stiff at them like they're trying to stiff at us. <laughs> Pray for those who persecute you and spitefully use you. A new commandment, he said. A new commandment I give to you. This, this is a commandment that hasn't existed before. But I'm not only give, going to give you this, what you, seems to you an impossible commandment to keep, but I'm going to give you the power and the ability Amen. to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were singing that a few minutes ago. You know, about, 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 we were singing a lot about his love this morning, weren't we? Just like the Holy Spirit always does, he always organizes everything so everything just comes together. You know, it says in the Psalms, it says, deep cries out to deep. I remember when I got born again and, and my life was totally changed and transformed, but there was just, there seemed to be something missing. I didn't know what it was. And I backslid and I was backslidden for, I don't know how long, it seemed like forever. It was a couple of years and then the Lord graciously allowed me to come home to him. And welcomed me back into his family. Not that he'd ever counted me as not being part of his family, but I knew I was home. And, uh, but that's what happened. And it says in the Psalms, deep cries out to deep. And something in the deep inside of me was crying out to the deep of God. And I thought, God, there's something out there in your deep. I, I couldn't articulate that, but that's what was happening. Now I understand what was happening. Something of the deep, in, the deep need in the inside of me was pulling on the deep of God. I knew out there somewhere there was something that he'd provided to fill, to fulfill this need. And it was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. See, when we're born again, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're born again of the Spirit. In fact, some people talk about being Spirit-filled, but you're actually filled with the Holy Spirit the moment you're born again. He takes up residence in your life. In that part of you that's been born again, you're born again Spirit. He comes and takes up residence there. Well, there's another baptism in the Holy Spirit that Jesus spoke about. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's, a, it's an endowment. In, in old Pentecostal doctrine, it was called the endowment of power for service. It's the Holy Spirit coming upon you to enable you to be everything that he created you to be. The new creation life that he's given you for that life to overflow you and begin to impact and touch the people Amen. around you. And that was the deep, I'd never heard about this, but this deep in the inside of me, because of the tradition I was raised in, I, I had no knowledge of this, but the deep was crying out, and God responded to that deep. It was about a year, eventually he led me to a place where, where, where I received that, which the, the deep in the inside of me was crying out for. And it, it totally, radically changed my life forever. It changed the direction of my life, it changed the course of my life, it, it changed the... It, everything about even where, where, where I was going to live this life, and <laughs> everything about it. Hallelujah. Took me out of the tradition that I'd been raised in and brought me into a new place of freedom. Say freedom. freedom. Like a certain ring to that word, doesn't it? Freedom. <laughs> Hallelujah. A new commandment, he says, I give to you. Not that you just love one another when you feel like it. Or when you feel like they love you. No, that you love one another as I have loved you. You know, and when, they, you know when, when he said that, they hadn't even experienced the extent of his love. They hadn't gone to the cross yet. It says that in the scripture, in the Corinthians, it says that at the cross he demonstrated his love for us. While we were still sinners, he said, when, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, he prayed and he said, Father, forgive them. Who's them? That's the people out there, the ones that had put him on the cross. The ones who agreed to him being crucified. Father, forgive them. They, didn't, they don't know what they're doing. 
He said, because by this, not by the size of your building or the size of your congregation or, the, or, the, or how awesome your praise and worship music is or, or the light show you're able to put on, not through any of that will they know that you're his disciples. He said, but by this, this one thing that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know. No one will be able to deny Amen. that you are his. He says that you are my disciples. Because they'll know that we learn from the best. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 to 2. This is from the Amplified Bible. It says, Therefore become imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well beloved children imitate their father. And walk continually in love. That is value one another. Practice empathy and compassion. Unselfishly seeking the best for others. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. See, I love the way he says that. Just as Christ also loved you, that's very personal, and gave himself up for us. That's more kind of corporate, isn't it? <laughs> you must never forget that, because we, we, all, we all want to have this amazing personal relationship with him, and that's, 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 that's the way it's meant to be. But it's not just about you, and it's not just about me. Amen? There's a big us in here. The good news of the gospel when Jesus arrived was God with us. And I, I like to put it this way, and God with us includes them. That's all the thems that you don't like to be part of us. <laughs> That's all the them and us that, that religion has created. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and sacrifice to God, slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance hallelujah I, I love the, the personal invitation Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30 uh, especially from the message translation and we've referred to this many times but it says are you tired worn out burned out on religion he says this is the invitation he says come to me get away with me and you'll recover your life I'll show you how to take a real rest walk with me and work with me watch how I do it Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That, that, that sounds like some invitation, doesn't it? That sounds like the kind of invitation that I want to respond to. Yeah. Amen. And so, that, what we're going to be start looking over this next while is learning to walk. <laughs> learning to walk. Learning to walk in love. Learning to walk in the same love. That he demonstrated for us. Amen. Hallelujah. So I've said over the, over the past few weeks, you know, we're in this, this year, we're, we've been given this prophetic declaration that it's a year of awakening to righteousness. But when we're awakened to righteousness, it's like, this, this is what I believe, we're, we're set free to walk in love. Because we know now that our righteousness is not based on our performance. And we know that because of that, there's no place for competing with anybody else anymore. Amen. We're not under the stress and the pressure to compete. Amen. and to, Amen. Amen. We're already the best we can be, as far as our Father in Heaven is concerned. We're as righteous as we could ever be. Because we have received His righteousness. Because He took all of our sin upon Himself and then gifted us His righteousness. His right standing with God. His ability to stand in the Father's presence without a sense of fear or guilt or shame. You know, shame is, shame is a terrible prisoner. A prison, sorry. If you become a prisoner of shame, it, it destroys your life. It eats away at the very basis of who you are. And there's no room for shame in our new life, our new creation life. Because with, with our shame, there's condemnation, and condemnation is, is <laughs> it's a wicked thing. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verse 1 tells us there is therefore now no, Romans 8, chapter 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who, who, who say walk, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What we learn to do, folks, we learn to walk. <laughs> See, the Bible says walk in love. It says walk in the Spirit. It says walk by faith. It says a lot of things about walk, but they're all synonymous, really. Yeah. You can't walk in love unless you're walking in the Spirit because Romans 5.5 5 says it's by the Spirit that he pours his love, the kind of love that he's talking about. He doesn't even ask us to have it in and of ourselves. He supplies it. And all he asks us to do is to demonstrate it. 
allow it to manifest in our lives towards others. You know, it's a pretty loveless world out there, do you know that? We'll be touching that in a minute. But, but when we're awakened to righteousness, we're set free to walk in love, knowing that our righteousness is no longer based on our performance. And that, 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 what a freedom that is to know that I'm not in competition with them anymore. Now, now, I've also used this illustration many times over the years, but, you know, who does it when, when their children are small? We don't expect them to walk straight away. You know, you come in, that child's a wee, goes, that child not walking yet? What's wrong with it? Get it up. <laughs> Stand it on its feet. You know, there's a time when, when, when they become strong enough and, and they, they're finally learning to walk. And then when they're finally learning to walk, we don't give up on them because they fall down at the first attempt. Or even the thousandth attempt. We're still there encouraging them, picking them up again, saying, come on, come to daddy, come to mommy. You know, it's, hey. You know, and, and, and when they finally take two steps together without falling down and they manage to grab onto the couch or something, we're on the phone to all the relatives, telling them, they're walking, they're taking pictures, it's on it's a, social media, there's a social media breakout, you know what I'm saying, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, everywhere, the kid's walking, you know, it's taking three steps, <laughs> let's walk in. And when they fall down, we pick them up and we encourage them to try again. Well, if that's the way we are towards our children, well, there's three wonderful words, words in the new, in the new covenant, and they're how much more. And these, how, these three words are always attached to our Father in heaven. Yeah. How much more does our Father in heaven celebrate it when he sees us beginning to walk in love, mm. beginning to walk in the Spirit, beginning to walk by faith? And when we fail, he doesn't condemn us and he doesn't crush us and he doesn't say, a useless article, you'll never walk. No, he picks us up and says, come on, Amen. try again. Yeah. Yes, no, in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, there's this incredibly wonderful picture. It says this, the Lord God in your midst. Do you know where he is this morning? Think about this. You know, you know where he is this morning? He's right here. In your midst. Right here. How do you know that? Because Jesus said he would be. He's even closer than that, but he wants to know that right now he's kind of moving in our midst right now. It says, the Lord God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice. And you know, In this verse, in chapter, in chapter 3 of Zephaniah, verse 17, it uses the word rejoice twice. But it's actually a different Hebrew word. And the first time he says, he will rejoice. He will be greatly happy with pervasive, irrepressible joy. If that's not the picture you have of your Father in heaven, you need a new picture. New understanding, a new reality. He, he, will be, he will rejoice, he will be greatly happy with pervasive, irrepressible joy over you with gladness. Over you with gladness. Then it says, He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice. And the next time it says, it means He will spin around with intense motion over you with singing. Over you. I believe that's, that's the way he reacts when he sees us begin to walk. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's a picture and a promise we need to take home with us today. Amen. Because we're going to be learning. Remember, we're going to be learning. I don't know about your life, but a lot of people, are, you know, when they see L plates in a car, they're like, oh no. You come up behind a car and the bar is moving, it's got L plates on it, and it's doing 30 mil, and then you're like, oh. we need to go over yourself. <laughs> Amen, because we're going to be learning. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. You see a brother and sister, and you know that they're in the same learning process you're in. You're not there to condemn them or to toot, 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 toot them. You know, you're not there to try and overtake them. You're there to encourage them and bless them. And be as accommodating as you can be to their learning process. Amen. Amen. You see, L-plates in a car, you should, be a bit, you should pull back a little bit. I've had this sermon from my wife several times. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Amen. God gives you a wife, he gives you a good thing. It's not, it's not a thing, but hallelujah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. How much more does our Father in heaven rejoice over us, celebrate when he sees us begin to walk? Hallelujah, the way he designed us to walk. Amen.
See, I, the, the more, I, the more I, I'm out there in the world, the more I'm out there just amongst people, the more I, I listen to people, and the more, the more of people's interactions that I observe, I'll tell you, and, and that's in, in this community in which we live, the more I become aware of just how few people know how to walk in love. How people are so quick to talk about one another. You know, they're talking about one guy, and then they move to, they move to that guy, and they're talking about the last guy. You know what I'm saying? It's like, but they don't, I don't think a lot of it's even necessarily, uh, you know, any kind of deliberate sort of um, attempt to kind of put people down. It's just, it's just it's the way they've learned. Yeah. It's just, that's, that's the behavior they've learned. In our Scottish culture, it's all it's culture. It's what's a sculpture? Our Scottish culture. Maybe that's just big in one word, sculpture. <laughs> I guess that's, that's all right. Eh? Every time I say sculpture, you know I'm referring to Scottish culture. <laughs> just as well, our father's a sculptor, isn't it? Hallelujah. He's a potter. We're the clay. Man. <laughs> but in our Scottish culture, it's just it's it's normal to pull people down. We call it slagging each other off. We think, it's, we think it's actually a good thing. It's an awful thing. You know why? Because sticks and t- stones might not break your bones, but names definitely will. Names will definitely hurt you. And a lot of people, some people are more sensitive than others. Yeah. Just as some learner drivers are more nervous than others. <laughs> a lot more cautious than others. I, I, I've not, I'm just beginning to notice more and more and more, and I'm saying, Lord... Because it's easy to get sucked into that, isn't it? But we're not here to get sucked into that. We're not here to be, according to Romans chapter uh, 12, we're not here to be conformed to this world, but be, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, what is your mind? Well, your mind is where you think. And your thoughts become your words, and your words become your actions. So to catch them where they're still thoughts. That's why it says, take every thought captive and that's part of our warfare, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, to learn how to follow him, to walk in the same way that he walked. So think before you speak. And think before you act. Because the way you speak and act will become a habit in your life. And I was thinking about this yesterday afternoon, and I thought, what was probably the highest compliment that people will pay someone after they've died? And I was thinking about it, and I'll tell you the one that's probably, the, probably the, the, the one you hear the most. He never said a bad word about anybody. Think about that. You don't hear it very often, but you'll hear it occasionally. And I heard it about someone the other day. A few people said it. Well, he never said a bad word about anybody. That shows you how much people really value that. Amen. I'll tell you, when we, when we start really learning <laughs> to walk in love, They'll be able to say that about us. But they should be able to say even more than that. He not only didn't never said a bad word at the end of it, he was always positive about everybody. He always had an encouraging word for everybody. He always had hope attached to every statement. Amen. Hallelujah. I think that about sums up Jesus. Amen. <laughs> become so aware of just how few people know how to walk in love and, and also I've become so much aware of just how much the world is crying out for that love it really is <laughs> and so we're going to take up Jesus' invitation we're going to learn from him as we walk with him and, and we're, we're going to see through scripture through these gospel accounts how he interacted with people as, as love personified because that's who he was he, he was love in the flesh <laughs> walking around there was love oozing out of every pore Every, every statement he made. Some people say, well, he shouted, woe to you Pharisees. Well, you see, but you don't understand who said that. There's different ways of saying things. You know, the, the tone of your voice tells you really what you... When he cried out, woe to you Pharisees, I, I believe he was, it was like, whoa, stop. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop living like you're living. Stop judging people the way you're judging people. Come, there's a life that you can experience and enjoy that God created for you if you'll just get out of that stuff. Amen. Jesus said, I haven't come to condemn. I've come to save. So he came to save the Pharisees just as he came to save everybody else. Yeah. He didn't make exceptions for the Pharisees. Here. I've come to save, but not them. I've come to condemn them. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Hallelujah. And I, see, I believe that as, as, we, as we learn from him, we're also going to allow the Holy Spirit to make the truth that, that he is alive in us. Amen. What did Jesus say? It's the truth that makes you free, isn't it? He says, when you continue in my word, you will know the truth. You will come into this intimate relationship with the truth, and that will set you free. He, said, he actually said, you will be, be my disciples indeed, and the truth will set you free. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, in verse 16, it says, What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? And I was, I was, just this morning, I was considering this, and I thought, oh, you know that religious tradition is an idol very often? You know that, you know that the biggest idols in the church are, are traditions, religious traditions? I'm not saying all tradition is bad, because it's not, but there are, there are religious traditions that are bad, that are so limiting to people's experience. In fact, Jesus said it. We might look at that later. Jesus said there's only one thing, basically, that can, that can actually hinder your progress in the kingdom of God, and that's tradition. Only one thing that can make the word of God ineffective in your life, and that's tradition. So there's certain religious traditions that have become like idols, and, and it's saying here, what agreement can there be between, a, this is again from the Amplified, what, what agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Even as God said, I, listen to this, I will dwell in and with and among them, and I will walk in and with and among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I want you to hear this one. He lives in us. Remember Paul said that, he said, the life I live is no longer my life that I'm living, I'm living, this is Christ is living his life in me and through me. He lives in us and he's with us and he's among us. He walks in us. Amen. And he walks with us and among us. And scripture says that greater is he that is in us and with us and among us than he that is in us. The world. That's the opposition he's talking about. <laughs> That's the one who is so opposed to you walking in love. So opposed to you learning to walk in love. He's the one that comes up behind you with a rum, 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 beep, 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 beep. Get out. He's, hey, come on. He's the one that's trying to put you off. He's the one that's trying to get you off the road. Because you're a hindrance to him. Come on. Anyway, today's just an introduction that you would be glad to understand. That's not the end yet, but it's an introduction. <laughs> an introduction to what? To walking in love. Do you know that walking in love is a narrow way? Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, again from the Amplified Bible. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss. And there are many who enter through it. Wide is the gate and broad is the way and easy to travel. I remember the first time we were in Atlanta, Georgia, and all of a sudden you're coming in, to, you come up through the city, and you're getting closer to the city, and all of a sudden there are all these lanes, like 12 lanes open up, you know what I'm saying, in front of you, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, more way driving with three lanes is bad enough, but all of a sudden there's all these lanes, and you're like, what in the world? <laughs> Well, Jesus said it's like broad is the way and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss. The world, the, the world says there's so many different ways. Choose your own way. Choose your own path. And that's becoming more and more and more pronounced as we go. And, and, and freedom has been lost to people because their, 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 their ways have been dictated to them and, and it's been held out before them as a way of freedom. And, they, and we can see it so clearly that it's leading them into bondage. I was thinking about this, you know, and, you know, walking in love, it's like driving on a single track road. We know about that, don't we? We don't have very many 12-lane roads around here, 12-lane highways. Or, but we do have a lot of single track roads. Sometimes when I'm out during the week, and especially down somewhere like South Locks, I don't know what happened after Gary Barr, but after that they decided they didn't want to get a double track anymore, so they just went... And you're, and you're like this, you know, and up in Uig, parts of Uig, and then down Harris, especially the Golden Road, and you're out doing it with a lorry, it's like, whoa! You see... You learn very quickly when you're driving on a single track road that there's a ditch on either side. 
In fact, the biggest challenge on a single track road is staying out of the ditch. <laughs> the guy that's with me today, somebody says, oh, he nearly went off there, you know, to be a digger job, he's always a digger, a crane, what to get a crane, you know? <laughs> That's, that's like your nightmare, you know, a crane having to come all the way from Stormy to lift you back onto the road again. You know, walking in love on one side, and there's actually a ditch on either side of this narrow way, you know that? And, and, and the ditch on, on one side is called legalism. And on the other side, the ditch is called license. See, legalism is, is tries to bind you up and change, and, 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 and it's always about con- condemnation, it's always about judgment. But this license tells you you can live any way you want. Everything's okay. You choose your own path, that's fine, that's your path. And, and, and there's, there's a new... De- See, we very foolishly sometimes thought that we could define love. But the Bible tells us very clearly that God is love. He defines love. And there is no new definition if you want to define love, you've got to say, well, this, God is love. And God has said some things. And if God has said some things, and if God, who has loved, said them, then they must be worthy of paying attention to. If he said it, it's because he loves us. Amen. If God said, don't do something, it's, he knows it's good. When your mother or your father said, to you, don't play on the railway line. I know that didn't happen around here very often. <laughs> it wasn't because they were trying to spoil your fun. It wasn't because they were trying to limit your experience of life. They were trying to save your life. Amen. Amen. Maybe in, 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 in where we live, it's like, don't walk too close to the edge when you're over there by the cliffs. Yeah. If you're in the sea, don't go too far out. All of these things are said out of legalistic restrictions. No, they're said out of love. The license says, ah, don't even bother about not going too close to this. Just jump off if you want. You're free to do what you like. Don't come crying to me afterwards. <laughs> you come, come on. So, so we're walking this narrow way, this, this way of love, this love that God has defined, that the Holy Spirit defines for us. So, so many people are afraid to speak truth because people receive it the wrong way because we, we need to learn how to speak the truth in love. Jesus always spoke truth. Amen. Because he knew that only, the truth was the only route to freedom in people's lives. But he always spoke it in love. Let, let me just, as I say, we're not, this is an introduction, so let, let me just sort of help you, or help us a little bit with this legalism, license stuff. Even from Jesus' life, from the Holy Spirit, in our lives, we know this, that legalism condemns sinners. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, but legalism condemns sinners. So if you find yourself condemning sinners, you're not in love anymore. You've moved, you've, you've gone into the ditch. You're, you're in the, the ditch of legalism. But then license, license condones sinners. Amen? You get that? Legalism condemns, license condones. So when you find yourself condoning sinners, saying, oh, well, that's their personal choice, blah, 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 then you're not in love anymore. Because love comes to save sinners. And the only way to save sinners is to speak truth to them. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? So someone's got to speak truth. But you have to ensure that you're speaking the truth in love. Because if not, you could be speaking legalistic truth, as you see it. Or you could be speaking licentious truth, as you see it. Well, well, God loves everybody. Well, he does. He doesn't love everything they do, though. Why? Because he knows that some some things are damaging. Some, Some things are destructive. And he loves us too much to... Just allow us to walk down the broad way that leads to destruction. He knows what's at the end of it. When I was thinking about it, there was an old hymn we used to sing back in the day, the old Pentecostal version of the Red Redemption hymnal, you know, 
It was, it was there. He abides, he abides, hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk in that way. I I'm not saying that, but I'm just speaking. For the comforter abides with me. It was, it was, that's the chorus. It was great verses. You can look it up, but you'll find it online. <laughs> the comforter abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter abides with I remember that singing that with gusto, hallelujah. Amen. I can't remember what number it was in the red book, but anyway. Here's something else about legalism. Legalism exposes sinners. We're going to look at this in practice with some of the uh, of, of Jesus' encounters with people later on, but legalism exposes sinners. If you find yourself continually in the business of exposing sinners, then you may have stopped walking in love and you may have fallen into the legalism ditch. But license encourages sinners. License says, oh, come on, you go, that's you, yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's it, that's that's the way you want to let you just carry on, that's it. But should you get in the other ditch then? But love, I was thinking, love envelops sinners. Love covers, the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. See, love, and we'll see this in Jesus' uh, ministry, love creates the environment for supernatural change. Love doesn't expose, doesn't condemn, doesn't condone, doesn't expose, doesn't encourage, but it creates the environment for supernatural change. See, both legalism and license are are connected to outward behavior. You understand that? But love is always connected with the heart. Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 15. There's a few verses here from verse 1. It says, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples... They're the guys who are in the legalism ditch. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition the what the tradition of the elders for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread he answered and said to them why do you also transgress the commandment of god because of your tradition for god commanded saying honor your father and your mother and he who curses father or mother let him be put to death but you say whoever says to his father or mother whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift to god then he need not honor his father or mother Thus you have made, and this is is what he says, thus you have made the commandment or the word of God of no effect by your tradition. You've rendered the word of God ineffective by your tradition. And he says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. That's a good thing. And then he said, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And the blind leads the, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall in to the ditch. Legalism will always end up in the ditch. License always ends up in the ditch. And those who, who advocate legalism, they're blind leaders. And if you follow them, you'll be, you'll be just as blind as they are and you'll both fall into the ditch. And those who condone sin and, 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 and through license, well, they, they're, they're just as blind. Yeah. And if you follow them, you will end up in the ditch along with them. God has given us his word, but he's not just given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, who interprets that word for us, who makes that word alive in our lives and who helps us and strengthens us and empowers us to live out that word. Even when our flesh is screaming, no, I don't want to do that. The Holy Spirit says, well, this is where we're going. Follow me. I'll help you. Jesus said, I'll give you another help and he's come to help us. Some things are hard and difficult. In fact, Jesus said, the difficult is the way. He said, 
in our scripture. Amen. Difficult is the way that leads to life. It's not always, but it's easy. But it's much easier because you said to take my yoga upon you because my yoga is easy. It's much easier than going the wrong way. I'll guarantee you that choosing wrong will end up a lot more difficult than choosing right. No matter how hard it might seem at the time. See, in our day, there are still blind legalists who teach religious tradition and lead people into the ditch on their side of the road. And there's equally blind licentious people who teach that everything goes, or anything goes. And so they lead people into the ditch on the other side, on their side of the road. In verse 15 it says, Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. See, what Peter said there, that's the heart of a learner. Amen. Learners ask questions, you know that. In fact, it says in James, it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He doesn't, this is my paraphrase, he doesn't slap you around for asking, he doesn't say, get out here, you stupid little idiot. He says, in fact, he says he gives liberally to everyone who asks. If you've got questions, ask him. He's not afraid of your questions. He loves to hear your questions. That's the heart of a learner. A good teacher loves to be asked questions. Amen. He's not looking for an argument, no. <laughs> See, but when the legalists asked Jesus a question, he answered them with a question. Do you know that? As you, the more that you learn to walk in the Spirit, the more you, 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 you get to you be able to discern and recognize the questions that are real questions. The questions that are designed to trip you up. Amen. And feel free to answer these questions with a question. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to answer that kind of question with. Because the last thing he wants is you get engaged in an argument or a debate. Who knows debates and arguments don't save anybody? It takes a while to learn that, but it's true. <laughs> it's part of the learning process. You can't argue anybody into the kingdom. But you can speak truth, and if they, if they are a lover of truth, they will receive that truth. They'll, they'll receive it as the very words of God, personal message from God to them, and they'll grab it with both hands and they'll run with it. But if they've already decided what they want to hear, then they'll buy everything that you say out of the ballpark. <laughs> Because they've already decided on their course of action. And they don't want to hear anything that might say, well, actually, that might not be the best way. Anyway, so Jesus goes on in verse 16 and he says, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But th- I won't get too technical about that. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Murders begins as a thought. Murders, adulteries, begins with a, adultery begins with a thought. If you don't know what to do with that thought, then you might end up in the wrong place. At the wrong time with the wrong person, doing the wrong thing. And Jesus said that's a broad road that leads to destruction. That will always be destructive. Adultery is always... Why does God say, not, do not commit adultery? Because it's destructive. It destroys lives. Destroys families. Destroys communities. Destroys relationships. And it spreads like cancer. Thank God for His grace. There's even grace for the dollars. Amen. But not those who continue on that path. But those who recognize God as a better way. As a way back. Amen. That's why we don't get, we're, not, we're not hitting people with legalism. We're just hitting them with love. Your adultery can't end well. That's love, says that. God's got a better way. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, and these thoughts can become murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemies. Jesus said, These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. He wasn't saying it's, it's not better to wash your hands before you eat. <laughs> That's why God put that in the law. You need to understand that. He put that in the law because it was hygiene, basic hygiene, and we all know that basic hygiene is a good thing. But if there's no way to wash your hands, well, don't starve as a result. You know what I mean? So that's the Lord to bless it. Amen. Including the German, the Germans, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Give thanks and get it down you. That's my philosophy. 
Anyway, so as we learn to walk in this narrow way, as we learn to travel and journey on this narrow way of love, then I believe that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is our highway code. Amen? You know, it's when you're learning, you, the front, you're in the highway code, isn't you? I mean, most people just chuck it in and never look at it again. It's actually been updated. If you don't know that, you maybe should get a copy or maybe go online and just see some of the things that have changed. And a lot of things have changed. So before a policeman asks you why you didn't do what it said, best to find out for yourself. <laughs> before you end up in the hands of a legalist. <laughs> Read the highway code because it will keep you free. And I believe that in our journey, in this road of love, this, as we learn to walk in love, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is our highway code. Because I said it before, you know, so often we get hooked on the power stuff, don't we? I love the power stuff. You don't love the power stuff? I love, I love the power of God. I love the healing power of God. I love to see people healed and saved and delivered and set free. And, and I love to hear prophetic words. I love to see people moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I love the anointed worship. I love all that stuff. But you know, in, in, the, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, it deals with that kind of stuff. And then right in there in the middle. Just so you don't get legalistic or licentious, even, even with the stuff, the God stuff. He puts this right there in the middle of this sandwich, this wonderful highway code. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it tells us everything that love is. And it tells us everything that love is not. Not just what love is, it tells us what love is not. And it, t- it tells us everything that love does, and it also tells us everything that love doesn't do. And so that, that's why I believe as we journey on, on this narrow way, we would do very well to learn our highway code. Maybe even memorize it. It's not a big deal, really. But at least refer to it often. So as we commit to learning to walk in love, let, let, let's, 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 this morning as we come, get closer to, to closing, <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's uh, commit to learning to walk in love, let's personalize our code and, and let's, let's ask and allow the Holy Spirit to confirm his word in our lives today and every day. And if we stumble or if someone else stumbles around us, let's be quick to get up or encourage them to get up and, and to keep on learning and to keep on walking in love. Amen. And let, let, let me read some verses from 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to, I'm going to read verses, uh, uh, the, the verses at the beginning because it's, it's, I think it's really powerful. That if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I love speaking in tongues. Man, that was, that was the gift that the Holy Spirit gave when, with that baptism in the Spirit. And it's like, wow, it's just so awesome to know that when you run out of English, you've got tongues. When you've got no prayer to pray, you can pray in the Spirit, you can pray in tongues. It's just, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. But it says here, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, then and this is, again, this is from the Amplified Bible, it says, and have not love for others growing out of God's love for me. And I thought, and I added a little bit there, and I thought... It doesn't say growing out of love for myself. Because some people have said, taken what Jesus said, and have kind of, I believe, perverted it a little bit. Because Jesus said, we need to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And they've taken that to mean that you need to learn to love yourself first. <coughs> well, I, 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 when I first heard that, I thought, well, I don't sound right. I thought, I need to learn how not to love myself. Jesus actually said something about yourself. He said, deny yourself. Yeah. So I believe what Jesus was saying was, take some of the love that you have for yourself and start giving it away. Yeah. Start loving others with the same love that you have for yourself. Yeah. Stop loving yourself and start loving them with a bit of that love. But really, it's but even more, more, more powerful than that, I believe, is that, it's, it's first of all, it's, I don't need to love myself because there's someone bigger than me that loves me more, more than I could ever need. He's my father in heaven. So I don't need to love him. I don't need to look out for my own interests all the time. I don't need to be obsessed with, with my own belly button. I, I don't, come on, I don't need to be stuck in that navel gazing, narcissistic mess. Come on. He knows my needs. Jesus said he already knows your needs. And he's in the business of supplying your needs. Every father knows that their primary uh, purpose is to provide and to protect their children. Well, how much more? Jesus said it, he said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, if you know how to uh, 
Then, then how much more will your heavenly Father? In one, in one time he said, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Another time he said, how much will the Holy Spirit give good things to those who ask him? How much more? Who, who's the Holy Spirit? He's, he's our Father in heaven's agent in the earth. They're both God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But he, 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 is, he is the manifestation of God in the earth right now to help us, to provide us. How much more? He's the God of how much more? Try that, how much more? So every, time, every time you meet an obstacle or a, or a difficulty, just say these words, how much more? Let, and let that turn your attention straight back to your Father in heaven, who is the how much more Father. Hallelujah. Anyway, glory to God. Not growing out of love for ourselves, but growing out of God's love for us. Let's love others. Let's not, and, and then it goes on and says, not growing, uh, sorry, then I have, if I, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, then I have become a, only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And it says in the Amplified, just an annoying distraction. That means you, you can learn, even by habit, to speak in tongues. And if it, if it isn't focused on, if it isn't flowing out of love, then it's just a noisy distraction. An annoying distraction. I have been places where I, where I have experienced that. Where I have discerned by the Spirit that, hang on a minute, the, this, is, this is a distraction. <laughs> this is, this, this is a Pentecostal tradition. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And, well, I can see that's flies. We'll leave that. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it goes on and says, And if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to the people and understand all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but do not have love, reaching out to others, I am nothing. That's when, like, sometimes when we're learning and, you know, we're children... And, and sometimes children are immature. And, you know, someone brings a prophetic word and then someone feels they have to either match it or better it. That's when we're back in competition mode. That's when we're back in childish mode. Amen. So we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't beat our kids up because of that. But we, you know what I'm saying? We just, Lord, help us by your spirit, each and every one of us, just to move this thing forward. Let us come to that place of maturity. I mean, I mean Paul even put it He said, let two or three... Mm. Why? Because he was dealing with people. He was dealing with a church at that time who were immature. Yeah. Who thought it was all about power. It was all about speaking. I said last week, if, if the Holy Spirit isn't giving you the words to say, then your words are of no value. There's no eternal value. Anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm saying this. See, we're learning. I don't know what I See, some people learn to drive really quickly. Other people, it takes them a long time. Some people sit in the drive, it takes loads of time. Yeah. Anne, how many times you sit? Right. No, not Anne. Seven. Seven times. But look, she's, she's driving now. Yeah. You know why? Because she didn't quit. Yeah. She didn't give up. She went back and tried again. Yeah. So you said, well, if you're sitting, maybe some of you are like, oh, seven times. <laughs> well, I only sat at once. Well, you know, well, that, was, that was your legalistic response to her, <laughs> to her admission that she sat at seven yeah. times when you should have stood up and applauded her. But now she's a driver. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why I asked her. Because I knew it was a lot of times. I didn't ask her to expose the fact that she's had it seven times. But because I think that's amazing. That she didn't give up. She didn't quit. At number six. Eh? She wouldn't be driving. She'd join off a driver everywhere. You know you know he'd be happy about that. But yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'll, 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 I'll just throw this in here. I, I sat my, my car test three times. You know why? Because I thought I could drive already. Because uh, yeah. I'd been driving since... Yeah. I, I'd seen my father, especially when we were here in Holy, can I have a shot of the car? You, know, yeah. you, could, you could just reach the pedals, you know. You'd kangaroo pedal, you know, bump, 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 <laughs> off you went. And, but then, I, then when I, I, was, I was very lawless and... and and when, when, as soon as I was about seven, I, I got a car and I didn't set my test, I just drove it. And, yeah. and, and I, drove it, I drove all around the island for years without a licence. And, 
And then I sat on a test when I was about 18, 19, and I failed it because I thought I didn't need any lessons because I thought I could drive. So I failed. And, and I, I, I left it two years and drove around all over the place, drove myself to the test, sat it again, failed it again. Why? Because I still didn't think I needed any lessons because I can drive. It's just pride, that's what it is. And a lot of times we... It's the same and, and as we're learning to walk in love. We, we don't think we need any lessons. We don't need to think anybody to come alongside us and to help us and, and to show you this is the right way. Yeah. That's what Paul said to this, as his, in his introduction. I, I show you a more excellent way. Just in case you think you already know how to do this, guys, because you're so full of your tongues and your prophecy and everything else. I want to show you a more excellent way. I want to give you some lessons. I want to, I want to introduce you to your highway code. So, and I don't know how, by the grace of God, I got it the third time, still didn't take any lessons. A few years later, uh, my mother-in-law had a bus company. She says, will you, will you do your bus license so you can help me out? And I says, oh, okay, okay. Well, it took a bit more persuasion than that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, before I sat on a bus test, I had two lessons. And then these two lessons, the guy showed me. Now, it's a much more difficult test, a much more... Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot longer, it's a lot more uh, complicated and, 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 and he just showed me what they wanted me to do and so I passed it first time there's a lesson there yeah. <laughs> amen there's a big lesson there and he said don't, don't, don't ever be shy of taking lessons from people mm-hmm. of, of, if someone comes alongside you and, and you recognise straight away this person even might sound like they're even criticising you See, if I'm taking driving lessons, I need someone who criticises the things I'm doing wrong. Not all criticism is negative. There's positive criticism. There's po- I always call it correction for redirection. That's the kind of correction the Lord brings into our lives. It's always to redirect us to, put us, to get us back onto the narrow way, to get us back onto the road. The road that leads to life. So we don't end up in the, in the ditch. I remember one of the times somebody said to me, the second time I saw a test, somebody said to me, he said, make sure the guy sees you're looking in the mirror. Some guy at work was before I went there. In fact, I'd written off my car just a few days before that. And I had to borrow another guy at work's car just on the day. And, and uh, I wrote it off on the, on the, on the Penland Road. And, and, and he, 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 this guy said to me, make sure the, 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 the examiner sees you're looking in the mirror. So we used to leave from the start in at that point. That's where you took off from. So we're taking off, I'm looking in the mirror. And... And just as we reached the town hall, some drunk guy walked out from between two cars. And, and I'm looking in the mirror. The examiner sees the guy, pulls on the handbrake and starts screaming, you know. So I, I figured after about 50 yards, I'd probably failed. He took me around the whole half hour. Baby. But sure, I see, so. Anyway, I won't labour that. I didn't even expect to talk about that the day. But anyway, let's go. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Well, I, I just something was just coming on that last uh, little testimony that I shared. <laughs> See, it's good to get advice from people who are qualified to give advice. Amen. That guy at work, that was just an off the cuff remark, but it, it, it probably failed me that test. Because really, he wasn't necessarily qualified. Because you, you don't spend your whole time looking in the mirror, your rear view mirror, otherwise you're going to end up in trouble. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Love, and look, let's, let's get into this. In fact, let, let's, let's personalise this. Because it, it goes on to tell us what love does and then it tells us what love doesn't do. So, will we try this? Will we stand up and do it? Amen. Let's do this. Hallelujah. This is what love does. But we are learning to walk in love, aren't we? So if we're going to learn to walk in love and follow Jesus and, and allow his life to manifest in us, then it's going to be about us allowing the Holy Spirit to do and manifest this love in our hearts and through our lives. Amen. So let's say this. I endure, I endure. With, patience with patience and serenity. <laughs> I am kind and thoughtful. And I am not jealous or envious. I do not brag and I'm not proud or arrogant. I am not rude. 
I am not self-seeking. I am not provoked, nor even overly sensitive and easily angered. I do not take into account a wrong endured. I do not rejoice at injustice, but I rejoice with the truth. I bear all things, regardless of what comes. I believe all things, looking for the best in each one. I hope all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. I endure all things without weakening. And it says that this incredible, awesome statement, love never. See, I never fail. When I walk in love, I never fail. When I walk in love, I never fail. Well, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Imagine a life where you never fail. Well, that's the guaranteed way to never fail is to walk in that love. That love that he pours into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. There's one in verse 13 says, And now there remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Why? Because love never fails. See, I'm learning to walk. See, I'm learning to walk in love. See, I'm learning to walk in love. Hallelujah. See how we dance. I'm learning to walk in love. You can even dance in love. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Let your walk become a dance. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Father, as we go into this coming week, as we go out through these doors, Lord, even today, Lord, as we maybe interact with other people, I pray, Father God, that we would be that demonstration of love towards them, Father God. That love that is so great, that, that love that, 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 that conceived the greatest gift that has ever, this world has ever received, the gift of your Son, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ who came and became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And him. help us to, to reach out with that message of love, that demonstration of love. Lord, that, 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 that love that is so powerful that it never fails. So that we might see all of these people who are so desperate and crying out for that love, Lord, might receive from you everything that they need and the how much more that you have provided for each and every one. In Jesus' name, we ask for a mighty harvest of souls. We ask that you would glorify your name in all of the earth by drawing people through that awesome love, Lord God, that you are so full of, that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, 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 oh,